Hello, Houston. We're just sitting here reminiscing about what's already been covered, and, and today we're going to just spend just the least little bit of time wrapping up our discussions on problem solving and creativity, because I kind of blew through creativity last time. So what I want to do is put back up on the screen the definition of creativity for you, and then let's ruminate about it um, for a couple of minutes. In essence, what's involved there is the generation of novel and useful solutions or products, depending on whatever kind of problem you're trying to, uh, to solve there. And the point that I was trying to make, there were several actually, one was that good problem solvers are not necessarily creative. That is to be one is not necessarily to make you the other. And therefore being creative is not just solving problems, but it's also being both on target, useful, and unique. That the, the, ed, the added word of, of uniqueness uh, feature in creativity sets that apart from pure problem solving. Um, they tend to be extraordinary, that is, the, the solutions. Consider uh, the two examples that I gave you last time that I won't burden you with a whole lot this time, but uh, the inventor Dyson came up with two different unique inventions, just in the la creative inventions, just in the last decade or so, one of which is the vacuum cleaner that is suspended in such a way that the whole thing is on a single rolling wheel, which then gives you the option to steer anywhere at any given time, which is harder, harder when you've got four wheels in the corner of a square. Uh, and the other was in, his invention of the drying machine that literally <laughs> blows the fluid off your, uh, off your hand. So that's good unless you're wearing a shirt or blouse that shows water, and then you've got water blown all over you. But that's a separate issue. Uh, it does, however, dry your hands, and it does it innovatively, simply out of his observation that if you look at what the other machines do that handle water, they, you know, drying of hands, they either evaporate it or they absorb it. That is, when you use towels, um, they, they absorb it. But in both cases, the, the, the fundamental action is, is not any sophisticated technique, it's just to get the water off your skin. So he decided we can blow it off just as easily as anything else, and it works. It's quite amazing. It's pretty powerful when you put your hand between the two uh, blower motors that are close enough just to allow one hand to get in there. Um, but the effect is the same. It's a creative solution to a constant problem we have, and that is drying our hands. Several books have actually been written about genius often labeling it essentially as a myth. Uh, and that title has been used more than once, the myth of genius. Um, and it, essentially what those authors argue is that, that mostly what, what creativity involves is ordinary thought processes that are methodically accumulating information. And in essence, what that leads to then is, is no sudden insights or great intuitive leaps or, or even unconscious processes. It is simply that when you've accumulated enough ev evidence or information on any given subject, um, new solutions will tend to come to you. The prepared mind is, is the one for which genius, in quotes, strikes. But if, if you've collected enough information, and I cited, for instance, the example of the Wright brothers, which of course had the good fortune to have a movie camera there the day that they did the first flight, you may or may not be aware of the fact that the entire distance of that flight is less than the wingspan of several of our modern day jet planes. That's how far they flew. But in fact, they were off the, off the ground and unsuspended uh, by anything directly touching the ground. That qualifies as flight. But there were years of research that went into that. It was, yeah, it was great when, when they finally made it, but it wasn't like they kind of sat in the barn and scratched their head and said, well, of course, we've got to make the top humpier than the bottom, and that'll create vacuum. That's what did it. But they found that out over many, many years of research in doing that. Dietrich, in 2004, did a rather interesting analysis of, of uh, cognitive neuroscientific explanations for, for creativity. And he reaches a rather interesting conclusion, which is consistent with what I'm arguing here, and that is that the circuits that process information to yield non-innovative combinations or information of information are exactly the same they yield novel, unusual, and creative combinations. It's the same circuitry in both cases, and what's involved there is the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. So creativity requires, first of all, effective control of your working memory. That is, you've got to be under control of the processes you're using. Secondly, you've got to have sustained attention. Certainly both Watson and Crick and, and uh, the Wright brothers um, were groups that focused on a given problem for an extended period of time and with support. You have to have cognitive flexibility, that is the ability to see the possibility of new combinations of the terms that you're, that you're worried about, and 
the ability to judge that's rational, that's irrational. That is, that's an applicable solution, that's not an applicable solution. Um, and so in experiments that, that provide examples of creativity, some rather interesting results have come out of it, and that is that if you put somebody in a situation where they're encouraged to be creative, give them some abstract forms, for instance, and the challenge to combine them to represent a tree, a flower, any of several different things, and then turn them loose with, okay, you come up with your own idea, what you tend to find is that they stack those things in the same way as they have to represent the tree or the flower or whatever other shapes are possible out of the, out of the ones that have been offered. So that even though you're, basically what I'm arguing is that by providing examples of, of innovation or creativity, what you do is reduce the likelihood that you'll find it. Not so much if you give them the example and immediately turn them loose, but if you give them the example and then delay their start on the project, 30 minutes, an hour, anything like that, what you find is that it's almost impossible for them to get away from the example that you originally gave them. Um, and so you're, you're, uh, you're limiting uh, creativity in exactly a situation where you're trying to foster it. Um, one of the cognitive psych book authors, Reed, had a fascinating section in the, in the text where he was talking about uh, kind of creativity and all the things that lead up to it and what follow it. And he himself confessed to being what he called an inadvertent plagiarist. And in, in fumbling around to, comma, to title the, the section that he was going to be writing, uh, he came up with a particular section for, a, a, um, for a, a chapter on problem solving and creativity or something like that. And having checked all the other books, he reached the conclusion that in fact nothing was there. He didn't, uh, in fact, he didn't even express it that way. What he did was to say from his knowledge, nobody else had used that particular combination that kind of packaged what he was going to be talking about. And how embarrassed he was when he opened another text uh, published within a year or so uh, of when his had already come out. Uh, and sure enough, there was the same chapter title, exactly. And, and personally, I can also attest to the idea that, that um, the, the, the fostering of, of academic ideas is a very delicate kind of process. Uh, the first academic job that I had was at the University of South Carolina prior to coming to Houston some 35 or 70 mm -hmm. years ago. Um, and in fact, it turns out that out of that faculty of about 20, there are four nationally published uh, introductory textbook authors. So there must have been, it, it wasn't necessarily that we were uniquely hiring that kind of person, but something about the, the intellectual environment that was alive in the, in the Department of Psychology 35, 40 some odd years ago at the University of South Carolina tended to lead to the production of people who produced introductory psychology texts. Um, the one model in, in Matlin's book that I did want to talk about just ever so briefly is what it's called, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but I would gather where it comes from. It's the Genoplore model. And in essence, it was proposed by Fink, Ward, and Smith in, in a 1992 article. What they were talking about is that if, if you conceptualize what's involved in, in, um, in creativity, he suggests that one successful way to model that or kind of describe what's going on is to think of it as occurring in terms of two strategies. One of them is essentially what they call a generation strategy, hence the Jenna part of the model they're proposing, in which what you're doing is is trying to plan how to produce pre-inventive forms. That is thinking about the overall project you're trying to solve. Think about many, many projects or many components that might actually ultimately lead to the solution of that kind of a problem. That's the generation strategy. And in turn then, the second strategy they talk about is the exploration strategy. That's the plore part of the genoplore model. And in essence, in that case, what you're fostering are basically plans for developing uses of the various things that you've kind of pre-invented or, or the mini models that you put together that may or may not bear on, on the problem that you're ultimately trying to, uh, to, to uh, solve. Dietrich in 2004 uh, was talking specifically about spontaneous thinking, which I would suggest is probably a pretty good source for creative ideas. And he was identifying that type of thinking, uh, the only one I'm going to talk about, as being essentially associative and sometimes unconscious. That is, that you and I may be processing information um, without being aware of the fact that we are processing it, then all of a sudden we arrive at, at uh, you know, we think about something which links us back to the thinking that's been going on and there's the solution to the problem we've been worrying about. I may have already told you about the idea that um, I was dreaming one time when I was in undergraduate school uh, and I had a math problem that I went to bed with and was fussing on and everything else and, and could not solve it during the course of the evening. So I went to bed a little bit frustrated, but I woke up at one point right after a dream 
which itself had revealed to me the answer to the problem. And so I wrote down butterflies on a sheet of paper and I picked it up the next morning and I had no idea how to get from butterflies back to whatever that was trying to encapsulate as a, as a solution. So in essence, the, the idea of creativity may or may not relate to any of the things that you have recently done. Uh, the examples that are often cited, for instance, are things like Newton, after watching apples fall from a tree, ended up giving us the, the theory and principles of, of gravity, uh, or the fact that Einstein, I had not realized this until the reading I was doing here recently, that Einstein's development of the, the concepts of relativity, which really significantly advanced uh, physics and our understanding of the universe, um, he did that after having imagined what it would be like to ride a light beam. That might not excite you, but clearly it turned a physicist on in, in a very effective way. So in essence, the, the, um, the pre-activity is sometimes really critical to, to the arrival at a state of creation. But I would tend to go back, fall back to the models I was talking about last time and at the beginning of this lecture, and that is that there's really nothing that I would argue that necessarily separates creative thought from other kinds of thought. It is simply that the mind that generates those thoughts looks at it from a different perspective or a little bit longer or in a little bit greater detail or with greater appreciation of what it is they're, they're dealing with, and the net result is they can see those unique combinations of things that work. So today what we're going to do is to jump into discussing logical reasoning and, its, um, and hopefully its predecessor to analyzing how we humans end up going about making decisions. The two processes go hand in hand, of course, though hopefully logical reasoning or something that passes for it uh, precedes our making of decisions. So we're going to start with one proce process today, that is logical reasoning, and then we're going to link from that after two or three lectures to our discussion of decision-making, which will be the last major topic we cover in the course before going into looking at, at how the overall processes develop. Watson and, and Johnson, sorry, Wason and Johnson Laird in 1972 assert that reasoning involves the process of drawing conclusions from two different things. One is principles and the other is um, evidence. That's what they're arguing are, are the basic constituent elements of, of what we call thinking. This involves advancing from what you already know or can be demonstrated to construct a new conclusion or to reevaluate someone else's conclusion, that is to restructure it in such a way that maybe you can extend beyond it or reach different conclusions or justify a different dis, uh, dis, additional advantages. That's the word I'm looking for there, advances. And so what it involves is, is basically advancing from what you already know or can be demonstrated to those new conclusions. Um, and basically, I'm going to argue overall, many have, that there are essentially two different types of, of processes by which this is normally achieved. One of them is deductive reasoning, which is what we're going to spend our time on today, and the other is inductive reasoning. Now, deductive reasoning basically involves moving from general to specific moving from general comments or general knowledge to specific kinds of derivations in that, um, in that kind of a situation. Um, so you're moving to, to specific applications from more general assertions or more general given conditions, whatever those may happen to be. Inductive reasoning, on the other hand, is the reverse of that. That is, what you're doing here is you're reasoning from specific givens or facts to observations, that which you know, to a more general conclusion that emphasizes or will explain the specifics. And so as you can see, they're headed in opposite direction. In this instance, the general conclusion may then be turned around to offer possible explanations or predictions regarding future situations. And so the, the two types of reasoning are really headed in exactly opposite directions. In one case, you're moving from general observation to specific kinds of predictions and details, and in the other case, you're doing the reverse. One difference between the two is really crucial. And that is the fact that in deductive reasoning, the conclusions that you reach are certain. That is, you can demonstrate if the premises can be documented, the conclusions that you reach are equally documentable. That is, what, what you're doing is working in this case in deductive logic. You're, you're moving from spe spe specific demonstrated facts or observations into provable assertions. And so the, the, in the instance of deductive reasoning, we're working with certainty. The contrast is that with inductive reasoning, what we're doing is working with probability. The best you can achieve with inductive reasoning, as we'll show you in a, in a later lecture, is essentially a well-based or highly likely conclusion. 
but there are other possibilities. So you're reasoning to, to probability, not to certainty, when you're dealing with inductive reasoning. So let's start off with deductive reasoning and look at it specifically in terms of the, the fundamentals on which it's based, one among which is logical propositions. And in essence, we can define a proposition for our purposes here simply as the smallest unit of knowledge that can be judged either to be true or to be false. That's a proposition the smallest unit of knowledge that we can prove true or false. For instance, I say to you, it's raining outside. Granting that, I can then assert, based on that initial uh, statement, if it rains, then my car gets wet. <coughs> and later, if you say, your car is wet, am I then able to properly conclude, my car is wet so it has rained? And the answer is no. The one does not follow directly from the other. It's part of the propositional calculus, which is right at the heart of what we'll be talking about for most of the rest of the lecture today. What makes this of interest to cognitive psychologists, that is why we even get involved in looking at deductive reasoning, is that people use propositions or some kind of cruder parallel and combinations of them in order to draw conclusions. It offers a means by which we can study humans' cognitive processes and their skills in reasoning, that is, utilizing those processes. Let's take a look at, at one example of that, and that is what I'm going to call conditional reasoning. In essence, in, in doing that, a primary form, conditional reasoning is a primary form of, of deductive reasoning, and it follows a classic format, and that is essentially, if A, then B. You'll get tired of that by the end of the, of the lecture, but in essence, that's the format. Um, it, it covers what I was talking about a minute ago. If it rains, then my car gets wet. A, if A, then B. At its simplest, I can say, it has rained, my car is wet. The one follows directly from the, from the provability of the, of the other. This is a deductively valid inference or, or conclusion or, or end product of reasoning in this case. But let's separate logic from correctness. If we look at the fundamental assertion, if A, then B, we've made one kind of a statement, okay? But there's another element to it. If it rains, then bananas turn pink. Well, at its simplest, I can say it has rained, bananas are pink. But as you can very easily appreciate here, while the statement may be logically correct, it's absurd. It's deductively valid, but it's foolish it flounders on, on the truthfulness of the original assertion. That is, if it rains, then bananas are pink. Um, that's what we're going to go back and, and look at. So, so in essence, if you agree with it, you argue with a psychotic, and you grant his or her initial assumptions or assertions, if you do that, you may very well lose your argument and find yourself reaching crazy, which is a political, not a psychological term, conclusions, okay? Conclusions that don't make sense when examined in the cold, hard light of day, okay? But if you grant those initial assumptions in any kind of an argument, you're going to have problems. Um, they, that is, logically, you're going to have problems. And, and again, the problem here is with the initial uh, assertions. You cannot attack the conclusion in that kind of a logic. But you can attack the premise, that is, the if part. So we cannot attack the conclusion once we've granted the assertion, the initial premise. But we can go after that initial premise. That we can work on, OK? And so what we're going to do instead is to attack the premise, the initial assumption or assertion, whatever it may be. So there are basically are two parts that we can work at. The antecedent, which is the if part, or the consequence, which is the then part of, of the statements that I'm going to be working with. And so there are two different things we can do. We can work with, as I said, the antecedent or the consequent. And then in turn, there are two things that we can do with that. We can either affirm it confirm whatever was demonstrated, or we can deny it. And those four really diagram the manners in which we can argue in terms of the propositional logic that I'm, that I'm talking about here. And this is valid reasoning, what's, what's being identified here. Well, some of them are. So for instance, um, if I were to, to consider the following example, I make a statement like, this is a banana, and in turn conclude, therefore, this is a fruit. Well, in case, it, it, what I'm doing there is, is arguing by valid reasoning. That is, in this case, what I'm doing is affirming the antecedent, okay? 
And so basically the antecedent there is this is a banana. Given the other things we know about a banana, we can therefore say this is a fruit. And so the technical process that is utilized there in, in logic is referred to simply as affirming the antecedent. That's legal. That's a fundamentally good way to argue. If you can prove the conclusion, that verifies the, the original assertion. And in fact, the conclusion itself. But let's try it another way. Let's argue instead, let's try this. We'll dim those and we'll look instead at, at the consequence and affirmation. So what we'll do is say, this is a fruit. Therefore, this is a banana. Now in that case, this is not true. This is, this is based on what is called invalid reasoning. This is not an appropriate way to operate in this, in this uh, procedure. And so in essence, what we're doing there is simply affirming the consequent. And that is a no-no. Okay, that is not considered to be a legal form of operation for the reasons that you can see up here. Understanding the relationship of banana to fruit, the original assertion, this is a banana, therefore this is a fruit, is okay. That fits with the, the fundamental logic we're dealing with. But the reverse is not true. Because something is a fruit does not necessarily make it a banana, specifically. And so what you've done there is you're guilty of what's called affirming the consequence. That's a no-no. We'll even give it a red X. We don't get to do that, logically speaking. There are two other possibilities. We can argue, for instance, from the negative, instead simply saying, whoops, I went past what I meant to do here, but that's okay, we'll just talk up to this point. The third possibility is we can try this is not a banana, and therefore this is not a fruit. That's not valid either, because in essence it may not be a banana, but it could just as easily be an apple. And it would still be a fruit by the overall judgment of, of what's involved in fruitness and banananess and so forth. So in essence, we cannot do what is called denying the antecedent. That's another Ill illegal process. And finally, let's try the, um, the, the, uh, the following process. I think I've got a, um, well, hang on a second. I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Um, the, the fourth possibility is this is not a fruit. Therefore, this is not a banana. And that, in fact, is the, the fourth of the, of the various options that we have there when in fact we are, 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 um, we are not affirming the antecedent nor affirming the consequent. We're not denying the antecedent, we are denying the consequent. And in that case, it is legal to do so. So this form of logic, the, the um, this is not a fruit, therefore this is not a banana, that would involve valid reasoning. So two of the four in the table that I showed you are actually deductively valid forms of reasoning. They are deductively valid. And those are the, the green ones in the, in the, uh, the statement here, um, the statements I'm going to be showing you here. Essentially, um, what I should have dropped in here, and now I see why I'm out of sequence, is that the other thing I wanted to talk about was a fallacy, which is basically what happens in, in the, the red type of arguments as I'm labeling them here. And that is a fallacy is simply a reason, reasoned conclusion which is deductively invalid. Two examples of which I've already laid out for you there, so let me just whiz through them here. I thought I had more of this table. So in essence, this is not a banana, and therefore we conclude, therefore this is not a fruit. We're in this box. Essentially what we've done is take the antecedent and we've tried to deny it. And that is invalid, okay? It is denying the antecedent. That's a no-no in the overall fundamentals of logic. And then fourthly, there is the possibility that, that we can take this is not a fruit, okay? And therefore we conclude, therefore this is not a banana. And what we've done in that case is the fourth of the, of the four options that I have, and that is we've taken the consequence and we've essentially denied it which is legitimate reasoning. So in two out of the four situations there, you have legitimate forms of, of argumentation, forms of argument. In one case, you can either affirm the antecedent or you can deny the consequent. And in both cases, you're using a fundamentally logical process by which to do so. But across the whole thing, there are really four different techniques of, of logic that you're usually, using to, usually, listen to me, that you're utilizing in order to achieve the, um, the process there. And I hope the red print will come through on the screen. But in essence, what we're dealing with is, as I said, affirming the antecedent or denying the consequent are both legal. But if you try to do either of the other two things, affirm the consequence or deny the antecedent, that is not logical given the examples that I, uh, that I talked to you about earlier. Wason has done a magnificent array of problems over the last 20 or 30 years, 30 years now, um, 
that have really kind of set cognitive psych on its ear because he's just been ingenious in creating various kinds of problems. First of all, to demonstrate the problems with logic when you fall short on it. And then secondly, to, to investigate how you and I go about studying um, or, or how we use logic to either verify what we're trying to do or, or fail to verify it, as the case may be. So in essence, in this case, I'm going to talk about one study by Wason and Johnson Laird that was published about 30, maybe 35 years ago. Originally developed a very interesting set of tasks, in this case, that had a set of four rules and implications that evolved from them. So the pamphlet in doing this, pro the, the patient, sorry, a participant is the word I'm after. I'll get there eventually, somewhere in the P range. Um, the participant is given four cards and a rule. So you've got these kind of cards that are presented to you, and you're given a rule. The rule is going to be, if a card has a consonant showing, then it has an even number on the reverse side. You can see there the, the elements of, of fundamental logic that can be applied in that situation. The challenge for you is, again, if the card has a consonant showing, then the reverse side has a, um, a number on it, an even number on it. Which cards of those four, what's the minimum number of cards you need to turn over to demonstrate the truth or falsity of that assertion? Okay. How many cards? Ponder that for a minute, and then let's look at it. If we turn over the R, what are we going to find? That is, that's one of the possibilities. This is an R. Therefore, this has an even number on the reverse side. If we find that, which of the four have we done there? Which of, the form for, which of the four forms of logic have we demonstrated in that case? Which sequence? See, despite your yawning, the lack of an answer is exactly why I'm going back over this. And I'll go over it two more times before we're done. So prepare to yawn a lot, but maybe you'll learn something. Okay? In that situation, what we've done is this. We have affirmed the antecedent. That is, we've, if we turn the R over and we find an even number, then you have proved the assertion by demonstrating the fact, that the, fact, the fact that the original assertion was in fact correct. That is, you took this consonant, you turned it over, and sure enough, there was an even number. But that's not enough. Okay, we've demonstrated one half is true, but there's at least another way among those four cards to still cause problems for yourself, and, and that is foul up the, the basic assertion there. If we turn over the five, This is a five. What's our prediction? Therefore, it has no consonant, because we argued that a consonant would have an even number on the flip side. So if we turn it over, and we cannot deny the consequent, then we have proven that the assertion is valid in that case. That's the second thing that you need to do. But think about it, there are two other cards there, and let's look at the effects on each of those. Those two moves, the first two that I've talked about, are the ones that are necessary and sufficient to prove the assertion. You've done everything you need to. The other two moves are unnecessary. Let me show you why. You don't have to turn over the vowel E, because what we've done initially was to affirm the, con the antecedent, and then we've denied the consequence. But then let's look at the other two. Let us suppose that you decide to turn over the E. What the assertion said was that if there's a consonant on one side, there's an even number on the other side. It didn't even address vowels. So it hasn't made an assertion about vowels, and therefore it doesn't matter what you find on the other side, it doesn't bear on the issue that you're trying to, to reach a logical conclusion about. Okay? That is, there's no logical reason to have to turn that over. It's not a consonant, so the reverse is, is we don't know. We don't care. It doesn't bear on what we're trying to, to demonstrate there. And then the other possibility is, in that case, what we're trying to do is deny the antecedent. But the other possibility is that we could also look at the number four, the fourth element that was there. That was the, the even number. You also don't need to turn over the even number. 
Because was there anything in the initial assertion that said you'd find an even number, um, I mean a consonant on the other side? Mm -mm. And therefore that also is, is wasted effort. You don't actually have to turn over the even number because finding a consonant would affirm the consequence. And that's not beneficial to proving the statement. But in fact, nothing was said about what happens if you have an even number on the visible side. All of the statement had to do with what's on the other side of a consonant, and that's all. So it doesn't matter what's on the other side of the, of the even number, because that's what you're turning over. And in fact, um, many people across all ages seem to recognize the need to affirm the antecedent. That is, people will very consistently reach for the R, because the assertion was if you have a consonant, you'll have an even number. That's easy. Many fewer people guess the need to turn over that, that other, uh, to deny the consequent. Okay? Consider there's an interesting example, and this, this is right down your alley here, and we'll give you the same kind of an example as before. So in, in this instance, if we turn the four over, what we're essentially trying to do is to affirm the consequent, and that's not legitimate reasoning that's involved there for the reasons that I've, that I've demonstrated there. But let's bring this back more pragmatically to, to the kind of things that you and I are constantly subjected to. You and I have seen demonstrations, and this is clearly written in a rich time, because look at what I promised you. I'll give you a thousand dollar rebate. What I should have done is made that a ten thousand dollar rebate. But they're really trying to pull us in right now. And you get that kind of ad. If you buy this car, then you'll be given a thousand dollar rebate. Even make it ten thousand. In essence, if that happens, does this necessarily mean that if you don't buy the car, you won't get the rebate? Could we argue that? Because in essence, in doing that, I didn't buy the car, I won't get $1,000. No, no. Because what's involved there is that you're denying the antecedent. Okay? I didn't buy, and therefore I won't get, is not logical. Dear old Aunt Irma may die and you get $1,000 anyway. It's, it's irrelevant to the, to the nature of what the car dealer is trying to say. The, the getting of the, of the $1,000 from the dealer is not even limited to buying the car. All he said was, if you buy this car, we'll send you that $10,000. Because you did not buy the, uh, the, the car doesn't necessarily mean that you won't get $1,000 from the dealer or anybody else. Get on the microphone. Go ahead. Yes, but. Okay, I see what you're arguing. Good point, good point. So scratch my demo and say instead $1,000. Good point. Nail instructor, instructor zero, student one. Good going. <laughs> okay, so we'll scratch the demo there and in fact leave $1,000. We will not put the word rebate in. Very good reasoning. Okay. Good point. That's what I get for sitting at midnight trying to write these damn things. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, your point is well taken. If we remove rebate, then in fact the demonstration still, still holds. And that is, if I didn't buy, it doesn't mean I won't get $1,000. You might even get it from the dealer. The, he didn't say that he wouldn't give it to you. He simply indicated that he, wouldn't, um, that he would give it to you under the conditions that you bought the car. And, and so there is a bunch of illogic that also hangs around that, that in fact still remains true. If you buy this car, then you will be given a a thousand dollars scratch rebate remember we did that if I if it wouldn't take so long I'd modify it right on the screen here but in any case um, the dealer sent me a thousand dollars I must have bought the car doesn't necessarily follow because all he did was to say if you buy the car you'll get the thousand dollars he did not say that he wouldn't out of the generosity of his extraordinary corporate wealth send you a thousand bucks anyway just for the heck of it um, there's nothing in what he initially stated that wouldn't argue that that was true. So you have to be careful that you don't get sucked into the other kinds of reasoning because then they start talking about, you know, when you go into the sales room with the rebate feature in mind, um, they then start trying to turn that around on you. If you don't buy this, you won't get the thousand dollars. That's faulty logic. I mean, they've set up the premise so that they've, got the, they've given the salesman something to argue about, but in fact, it's, it's faulty logic by which they do that. Salesmen don't tend to be responsive to that kind of analysis of their, of their sales pitch, but in fact, uh, the logic is not correct, as, as you can see in that uh, particular situation. This is a case where your everyday experience tends to encourage wrong logic, fallacious logic.
Um, Kirby has done some, some uh, work in the last decade or so, decade and a half, that, that basically bears on this same general issue, and it's still going back to that if A, then B. But what he's arguing is essentially that people are far, far more prone to seek information to deny the consequence, which is legal, uh, valid, in situations where the assertion is something like, um, like this. If a person is drinking a beer, then that person must be over 20 years of age. I had a real go-round with, with what Matlin says in, uh, in, in discussing this in her book, because the assertion that I've used is a parallel to exactly what she's arguing. Um, but the problem is that what's fouled up here is the precision with which this language is being used and the imprecision that's built into it. Because actually now, as you know, the, the law in Texas and nationally, I guess, is 21 years of age. So in fact, the way that assertion should really be stated that is that a person must be at least 21 years of age. It is not the case that they have to be over 20. Then if you go back and look at the logic by which Matlin presents the argument, she skims over what is a confusing issue there. And in fact, technically, precisely what she argues and what this statement says is not correct. What you really should be saying is has to be at least 21 years of age. That is, you can't be 20 point anything and still qualify legally to be drinking. Okay, And so in essence, if a person is drinking a beer, then that person must be over 20.xx years of age, we'll argue there. And so in essence, um, if a person is drinking beer, then that person must be over 20 years of age. And we normally attempt to, to uh, disprove it by denying the consequence. The person is not drinking beer, so we don't know how old they are. Okay, but you're much more likely to worry about the 20 year olds in the crew than you are the six year olds or the four year olds. That is, the issue is, is somehow much more close and important to us when the age of the, the, uh, the eligible candidate is, is getting close to the, to the cut point where they shift from not being able to drink a beer to being able to drink a beer. So, how do we make decisions like that? Well, that in fact leads into uh, another area of research of which there are, or which, of which there are several examples. Um, and, and in essence, um, Keith, uh, Patricia Chang and Keith Holyoke in 1985 studied how people like us, logical people, efficient people, dedicated people, apply deductive reasoning to our everyday world. And that is that what we tend to do is to develop um, a, a, a set of rules that is essentially, we could describe it essentially if you want, as kind of pragmatic rules or, or um, gut rules, uh, rules of experience. We do not tend to use formal rules of, ob of logic when we're going through these kind of decisions that we all have to make. Um, and so instead what we've developed is what are sometimes referred to as pragmatic rules. Okay. And in essence what I'm, what I'm defining there is essentially the general organizing principles or rules that are utilized for achieving particular kinds of goals things that are important in the everyday world that you and I operate in. Things like permissions, um, obligations, or causations. What led to what in a given situation. Um, this definition actually comes from some writing by Sternberg in, in 2006. These are not as abstract as the propositional calculus, which we were talking about a little bit earlier. They're much more widely applicable. Um, and if past experience essentially doesn't suggest an answer, what we tend to do instead is to use a pragmatic rule to deduce a defensible interpretation of whatever it is we're trying to look at and then make judgments um, upon. Suppose, for instance, just as a practical problem, suppose you're the chairman of a high school formal uh, of a spring evening. It's after dark, you have to protect the, the virginity of both males and females, that's your assigned responsibility. You observe a student and his date come out of the dance, get into a car, and drive away. Okay? That's a no-no, maybe. One of the questions you ask pragmatically is, how old is the male? And if the answer is at least 16, you reach that conclusion because if he's permitted to drive after dark, then he must be at least 16. So you're kind of applying a, a rough logic to what's going on, but it is not quite as formal as, as, the, crip, as the crisp if A then B and all the confusions that re relate out of that. You might even push it a little bit further. Whose car is he driving? Well, in fact, you can look at that based on the evidence. Again, the causation. If it's a ratty car, 
the odds are very strong that it's his. If it's a brand new Lincoln LS, probably the parents. But in both cases, we're using the kind of pragmatic rules of them kind of mixed with, with the, the, uh, the, the calculus we were talking about as opposed to the experience that, that we all benefit from in any given, any given accumulation of time. Chang and Holyoke, for instance, in 1985 found that 62% of college age students utilize either affirming the antecedent or denying the consequent arguments, the correct ones, when they're faced with permission statements, which required conditional reasoning in order to, to solve. Only 11% selected such styles when pragmatic reasoning skills are not drawn in by the subject matter that's being processed. Okay, so when, when it's obvious, that is when it's life related, pulling in the correct logic is pretty easy. When it's more abstract, it becomes a tougher issue. And I'm gonna give you some examples of that here uh, in just a little bit. Um, so now we do make decisions. So how do we make decisions in the pragmatic world that we actually face? Well, well some have suggested that, that although we don't always demonstrate correct application of the, of the propositional logic, calculus I should say, we do use a kind of natural logic that may draw on any of several different types of rules. And I want to suggest some of those for you. When you go about, um, when you go about trying to affirm the antecedent, uh, you apply that logic in, in several different situations. For instance, in developing of contractual rules. One of the ways in which contracts are normally suggested or specified is in terms of permission. If A, then B. If you build a house with 17 pages of specifications, then I give you whatever. 300,000, 307,000, 516 dollars, or whatever it happens to be. But that is essentially an if-then kind of statement. A contract is itself essentially of that form. Obligations uh, are another kind of thing that can be handled in, in that kind of way. Um, if one thing occurs, then a second thing will result. Okay? Speakers, or not speakers, but, but entertainers are very concerned about the arena in which they appear. And I can just imagine the negotiations that go into having somebody appear in, in the, um, in the uh, Reliant Stadium when, when the um, rodeo is going on, because that is a very, that's probably unique in all of the world as an entertainment venue with, with the rotating stage in the middle, great distance between them and the nearest fans and so forth and so on. And so the rules have to be cut a little bit differently there, but there are still certain obligations. If, my, if me and my band appear, um, you are then expected to, you know, the lighting, the sound and everything else is, is wrapped up in there. You've also got causal rules that, that are factored into that in terms of, of uh, um, if one happens, if one thing happens, then the other thing happens. Uh, that would in include things like uh, why it is that, that institutions govern uh, themselves and run temperature at a particular level. Okay, if the temperature is set above thus and so, our, our power bill goes way up. That's one of the things that absolutely stuns me about the University of Houston is that we're so concerned about saving money. And yet you look at any academic building on this campus, any time of the day, 24 seven, and the lights are on. Every available hallway light is on. Doesn't make sense if the causal rule is we're trying to save money here. So in any case, um, one other that falls into this, this area of natural logic is my favorite. And I'm coming back to talk about it because there were a couple of things I wanted to, to pose to you uh, the other day when we kind of rushed through it that I didn't really get to. But this is based on the idea that the larger the, the size of the sample, the more probable any event which is demonstrated um, is not a random event. That is, it, it's reflected in the, in the overall group that you're sampling. To explain this law, I need to anticipate something that we're going to talk about again a little bit later. But if I were to simply flip a coin here uh, on the table and I ended up with tails, I do that again and again. And in fact, what I actually lay out here is six coins in a row that are tails, 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 tails. Many people, including many and most gamblers, believe that the odds are greater than 50% that my next cost, toss will be ahead. That is, if I've had six tails in a row, people will not bet even money that the seventh one is 50-50, gonna be a heads, gonna be a tails. They will tend to favor the heads as the next experience. And what they're doing there is they're creating, they're, they're committing what is called the gambler's fallacy. And that is, uh, it's, it, the logic behind it is, is very interesting. And that is the idea that if a coin is fair, then it must be the case that if in the long run it will produce, or that in the long run it will produce an equal number of heads and tails. That's true. 
That's a logical extension out of the, uh, the law of large numbers and uh, general logic and, and probability. But if no heads have appeared for a while, then to maintain its fairness, we're thinking, the coin must land on its head. No. There's no memory in that coin. It doesn't have a memory of the fact that it landed on its tail six times before. And so, in fact, there is no process by which the outcome of prior tosses can influence the outcome of the next, next toss at all. Our memory is what's fouling us up there because we're thinking to ourselves, gee, I've never seen six in a row. Well, we can't do seven in a row. I've absolutely never seen that. Well, the seventh toss is just as likely to be a heads as it is to be a tails. It's still operating. Each toss operates at 50-50, period. Okay. The error in logic there involves what is sometimes called category homogeneity. That is, it's, it's correct that in the long run, an unbiased coin will fall heads half the time and tails half the time. That's true. But the key phrase there is in the long run. It is a description statistically of an infinite number of, time of, of tosses. And in fact, it'll be 50-50 in that proportion if, in fact, it's an unbiased coin. But that assertion only applies to all tosses. It does not apply, it is not attributable to a category of tosses. It is not true of any six, of any two. It certainly isn't the case that if you get a head the first time, you gotta get a tail the next time. So that means that it's gotta operate across more than two, and in fact, you extend that logic, it has to operate over more than any finite number of tosses. Because it's talking about, in the long run, all tosses that you might make. The error in logic, is in assuming that the, the uh, homogeneity of, of balanced numbers of heads and tails applies to any subset of the totality of all the tosses that we could make. That is that any representative sample of the entire category will have all of the category's properties. That isn't so. If I toss my coin, let me show you specifically. If I toss my coin four times, these are the possibilities, okay? On those four, I may get no heads and four tails, and you can follow the logic all the way down to where I get four heads and no tails. But in fact, the likelihood that I'll get any one of those in a, any particular run at random of four tosses is, is 20%. It's exactly equal across each of those, because remember, we talked about an unbiased coin. And so in that case, um, some of the sequences may be 25% heads or no heads, this provides a basis for explaining the law of large numbers. And if we study a large number of toin, coin flips, then we will tend to see that the splits are, are pretty close to 50-50, again, assuming it's a fair coin. But in fact, in 50%, sorry, 40% of those cases, you're going to have a bias where it's three to one, one direction or the other. And in fact, that's going to happen twice as often as the situation where it's equally often heads as it is tails. It's going to be biased three to one, two out of five times, and only one out of five times will it, will it on the long run, be, be equally numbered. The problem is that there is simply no reciprocal law of small numbers. It doesn't exist, okay? Small samples, though they're expected to, do not always mirror attributes of the larger population from which they're drawn. Okay, Kahneman and Tversky provide an example of that which we talked about at some length last time and I came up with an even more extreme way of demonstrating it for you. I should have thought it last time, but last time and I forgot to, to pose it to you. But if you remember, the, the problem that I was proposing to you was that in a small town, uh, there are two hospitals. Hospital A has an average of 45 births a day. Hospital B is smaller and it has an average of only 15 births a day. And as we, as we all know, the number of births of, of males and females is roughly proportional. The number of males on the earth is actually lower, but that's because of war. Uh, that's the primary reason why the ratio is disbalanced slightly. But in terms of number of births, it's essentially 50-50. And so the problem that is, is posed to you is essentially how often would either of those hospitals, the large one or the small one, reach a condition where at least 60% of their births were, say, male? or flip it the other way, 60% female. And many people tended to choose the larger hospital, I guess on the assumption that more samples gives you more opportunities, but the fact is it was anchored to the day. 
And the extreme example, the, the way to win that argument and to demonstrate to you that, in fact, it's the small hospital that is more likely to demonstrate that is push the example to the extreme. I mean, if we get almost the extreme, we think about a large hospital with 1,500. And we're thinking, well, there's just no way you're going to get a 90% split where you've got 150 uh, of one sex and 1,350 of the other. That would be an extraordinary deviation from a 750 split evenly. But push that to its total extreme. Let's go to the small hospital and look at the situation where that hospital is so small it only has one birth a day. What that means is, in that case, you're either going to produce a male or a female. And so each of the days in that small hospital will, in fact, always violate the idea that it's usually 50-50. And every one of those samples would, in fact, be an instance where greater than 60% of the sample is one or the other. And so, in essence, the, the, what, I'm, what I'm really messing around with in your head there is, is the, the impact of the, of the law of large numbers as opposed to the law of small numbers, which is non-existent. It might be the wished-for law of small numbers, but it doesn't work. Now, let's also jump into here another factor that I want to look at a little bit, and that is some of the ways in which we try to win arguments and, and demonstrate truth or falsity in, in a given kind of assertion like we've been working with here. What I'm going to talk about is basically uh, looking at the importance of falsification. That turns out to be something that is very important in, in this kind of logic. So far, we've been talking about deductive reasoning, but before we move into uh, inductive or, or syllogistic reasoning, um, I wanted to interject a, a cautionary note here. In fact, I'm going to offer you two free pieces of advice, which are worth at least that much, okay? Um, for you blossoming deductive and inductive logical reasoners here, I'm going to offer two pieces of advice. One is the fact that there may be times when it's better not to solve the problem. That is, solving it is not so important to, to demonstrate the veracity of what's involved, perhaps, that in many cases, what it may be, there may be times, I should say, in which it's more important to try to identify exceptions to the confirmation, uh, sorry, to the demands, than, than to demonstrate a confirmation of the demands. Um, deductive problems and syllogisms, of which we'll talk more later, uh, were not developed by psychologists originally, okay? They were not created to understand cognitive processes. That's an end use, but that was not the reason the, the uh, propositional calculus was originally developed. Um, Wason, whose four cards problem we analyzed earlier, has invented a number of different in interesting problems that have developed to, be, to analyze specific aspects of reasoning, and that's really the target of his work. Um, and I'm going to pose a couple of problems to you. I'll give you an easy one first, which we actually have also already talked about, and that was what's called a generative problem, um, one of which I gave to you. Um, what he said was the numbers 2, 4, and 6 confirm to a simple rational rule which I have in mind. And as I told you last time, um, the challenge to the student in that case, and to the uh, person addressing the progressive number problems, is given that sample which fits my rule, what is the rule that I've actually um, generated? What's the rule? And if you run that as a classroom demonstration, maybe someday when you're responsible for a class, you might try it out. What you will find is that the vast majority of, of offerings are simply offered up for confirmation. And so people will get real bold and say 357. Well, yes, you're right. And then they'll get really bold, 51115. Well, yes, you're right. And a lot of them will be starting, and then they'll get real bold, minus 2 plus 2, 6. Well, yes, you're right, and so forth. The difficulty is that they're not really pushing the limits. What they're doing is, is simply reaffirming um, what's been involved in, in that particular, um, in, the, in the example. That's a case apropos of what I was talking about several, several minutes ago where we talked about creativity, well, beginning of the program, um, is, is the creativity in some cases can be frustrated or limited by providing a, quotes, example of, of creativity, because then people tend to narrow their thinking specifically to the example that you've given them. That's not necessarily the way to foster creative solutions. So in essence, by slipping in that very subtle, well, one, one example would be, say, two, four, six. What that tends to do is to severely constrict the sequence or the rules that people will look at, assuming that the person is, has very carefully selected the specific features of the rule to make sure that they're followed. Well, in fact, what he was specific about was the example that he chose, because he was really in that situation trying to kind of actively mislead people, and sure enough, it works, <laughs> because the vast majority of people uh, will guess and suggest positive numbers. And if you think about it, 
If you go back to the very first and second lecture in this whole series, you will find that one of the things I was talking about is the, the kind of sheep-like mentality of many scientists. And that is that we often, when we do experiments, and I include me in the generic we here, um, what we tend to do is conduct research that conforms. And in fact, that's one of the rules that kind of, and people have written articles about this, but that kind of subtly operates even in editors' decisions to include or not to include this, that, or the other article in a given journal. And what happens is that the logic is, it's not quite this crude, but what it essentially boils down to is, well, gee, this doesn't agree with any known law. I don't think we'll necessarily include that. It's, it's so contrary to everything else we've found that maybe it isn't appropriate for us to, to publish it. So they'll send a very diplomatic letter of rejection, and although they'll be suggesting you may be more particularly suited to it and they'll name another journal, what they're basically saying is, no, and that's the bottom line effect. Well, it will, finding the rule in this kind of a generative problem is, should be operated not in parallel to what goes on in science so frequently, but rather the contrary. That is, in that case, the more effective way to nail down the rule is try to find ways to violate it. And in fact, the challenge there is that you're, you can offer up any sample and he'll tell you instantly in the experiment, yes, you're right, no, you're not, and so forth. And the trick is to come up with 531. Well, no, that's not correct. Okay, let's see, 567, yes, that's correct. S uh, 565, no, that's not correct, and so forth and so on. What you're beginning to do is, is to push the boundaries and you're eventually finding out that the limiter is not that it has to be regularly just two that's added. But it is, in fact, not the addition at all. It is simply the, the sequence, the numbers. How far the gap is, is immaterial. It simply is it a progressive product that you're, that you're producing. So in essence, you, you reach that by, by using what is called an eliminative strategy. Okay, that's a kind of a fancy word, but what, it, what, what you have to do really to solve that, that rule problem is not to come up with additional confirming one, two, three kind of sequences, but rather, what are the exceptions? And out of the exceptions, you eventually find that the progression is the only thing that's relevant. Because if you get concerned that it might not be two numbers, you might go two, six, ten. And sure enough, that's correct. So obviously, having only two increased doesn't matter, and so forth. So what you're doing is, is finding the exceptions uh, to a rule uh, when you start looking at, at reverse sequences and various other combinations of numbers. And you really have to push those limits to discover the rule that Wason was talking about. Far and away, Wason's most progressive, intelligent, challenging problem was the Thog problem, OK? And the Thog problem is a classic in the field of psychology. It was originally proposed about 40, almost 45 years ago now. But you're given a very simple series of, of uh, stimuli. This is it. That's A, B, C, and D, and that's all you need to work with here. And what you're given is the fact that I have written down a color and a shape. Okay? And in this puzzle, what I'm going to do is to specify a rule, and that is that a design, if it includes either one of uh, the color that I've listed or the shape, but not both, it is a thog, T-H-O-G. Okay, so we've given you these shapes, and I have, I'm telling you I have written down a color and a shape. And then I will tell you that a black diamond is a thog. And the question then is, what can you tell me about the other shapes? Which of those are thogs and which are not? Two different kinds of, of uh, solution problems are created here. One of the biases that tends to be worked at is the intuitive error. That is, when you look at that, what you tend to think to yourself is, well, let's see, it's a black diamond, so we've got to change one of those things. So let's, let's say the, the white diamond. That doesn't share black. That's got to be a thog. And going the other direction, the, the uh, black circle has to be a thog because, yeah, that's got the same color, but the shape is different. That would then lead to errors. Because in S, in, intuitively, um, you're saying that the white circle is not, because they've changed both things there. And so that can't qualify, that can't be a thog, and therefore the other two must be. That's an intuitive logic, and it's actually wrong. And I'll show you why here. Okay? 
The other possibility is a matching bias. That is that you, you somehow tend to think that, that uh, the, the bias that's involved here is if, it's a, if a black diamond is a thog, then a white diamond or a black circle must be a thog based on similarity. That's also wrong. Now the logic here is very difficult. The, the, the data that they have here is that in, in, in some cases, let me jump ahead here in the notes, see if I can find it for you. Yeah, Smith and Clark gave students this uh, subjects this problem. And what they found was that, that um, tw only 12% of the time did people identify correctly what a thog is and the logic behind it. Have you got a candidate in the room? The idea, remember, is that the black diamond is a thog, and as long as the element I've written down, a color and a shape, and in order to qualify as a thog, you have to identify any shape that has either the color that I've written down or the shape that I've written down, but not both. And so in essence, when I told you quite swimmingly and glowingly and smoothly that the black diamond is a thog, what I've also told you is that one of the features in that black diamond is not represented in other thogs. But it was done so subtly that you may have missed it. I have a lot of trouble intellectually with this problem. I spent all night last night while I was taking the shower this morning wrestling with that to make sure that I could explain it. And I cannot. I simply cannot. Because in essence, and you'll see what the problem is here, what I'm going to do is read a paragraph from a book by John Benjafield in 2007, a cognitive psych text, which has in it one of the best, not one of the best explanation of, of why a thog is a thog and why it isn't, as follows. Listen to what he says here. Let us say that if we can understand why the white circle is, a, let's see if we can understand why the white circle is a thog, and that's the only other one that actually is, okay? What color and what shape could I have written down? That is, if I've told you already that the black diamond is a thog, what color and shape must I have written down? There are, it turns out, two possibilities, and therein lies some of the confusion. But in essence, as, as Benjafield writes here, a thog has one and only one of the properties that I wrote down. So by telling you that a black diamond um, is the... Is the um, the thog, um, what I've also identified is that one of those two features, either diamondness or blackness, cannot be included um, in the other example. And sure enough, because the black diamond is a thog, either I wrote down black or I wrote down diamond, but not both. And there's the hang up. Okay? Suppose the color that I wrote down was black. Then the shape I wrote down must be what? I'm not budging till I get a suggestion. We can spend 30 minutes of silence or we can address the problem. If black diamond qualifies and I wrote down black, what is the other word that I must have written down if in order to be a thog, it can be one or the one color that I selected or the shape? So what does that mean if I wrote down black, what I have to have written down was See, I told you it's not an easy problem because what you're dealing with is the exclusionary rule here. If black diamond qualifies, then if I wrote down black in my secret list, what it means is that I have to have written down circle because remember, to be a thog, it can only be one or the other color and if it identifies the one that I've selected on one feature, it cannot use that feature in the other one, okay? So the solution is that if I wrote down, in fact, white circle is definitely a thog. Now, whoops, I'm, I'm behind myself here. Because the black diamond is a thog, either I wrote down black or I wrote down diamond, but not both, because black diamond qualified. And in order to be a, a thog, it can only have one of the two features that I wrote down, okay? Suppose the color I wrote down was black then the shape I wrote down must be circle. If the color I wrote down was black, then I cannot have written down diamond because then the black diamond 
would have both names that I had written on the paper, and we know that a blog only has one of the names I wrote on the paper. Therefore, if I wrote down black, then I must have written down circle. Let us continue on and see what that would mean if I had wrote down black and circle. It would mean then that the white circle was a thog because it has one and only one of the properties that I wrote down. It would also mean that the black circle was not a thog because it has both of the properties that I wrote down. Moreover, the white diamond cannot be a thog because it has none of the properties that I wrote down. And he goes through, I won't take the time to go through all of the other combinations. But therein you begin to see the complexity of what's involved in that particular problem. And what's really making it is, 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 uh, uh, so difficult is, is the rule that I'll get to here in a minute. Let me just go back through the, the things that I put on the screen here for you and look at the, the various solutions that are possible, okay? What's actually written down, one color and one shape. If black and circle, then circle is a thog. Black circle is not because it has both, and white diamond is not because it has neither feature, if I wrote down black circle, given that black diamond is a thog. If white and diamond is what I wrote down, then white circle is a thog. Black circle is not because it has neither feature, and white diamond is not because it has both. And so Notice, consistent with deductive logic here, that a specific, necessary, and defensible answer can be derived from those rules. A second bias that tends to crop in here is what is referred to as the matching bias. And that is, if it's a black diamond, uh, that's a thog, then somehow white diamond or a black circle must be a thog. Well, no by the logic that I was just describing to you. What's involved here and what causes the problem is that what you have to use is the rule of exclusive disjunction to solve this problem. That's the rule that you have to apply. To qualify, an object must have one or the other feature, but not both. Okay? And that's the, the disjunction. The fact that to be a qualifying thog, you can have either the color I wrote down or the shape, but not both, and obviously not neither, which makes that an extremely difficult problem to solve partly because of its abstractness. You'll remember another of the fundamental principles that Matlin talked about was the difficulty of abstraction as opposed to concrete. Let me give you a specific parallel example that you can wrap your head around here probably pretty easily. What I'm going to do now is to give you yet another generative, another generative problem. Wason has produced hundreds of them for us. Here's a list of four women. Okay. I'm going to give you several premises initially, okay? My mother and father are divorced, okay? Each has remarried. In the problems I'm about to give you, Steve is not my father, and Beth is not my mother. You'll notice here that we've set this up by exclusion. And that's another of the principles that Matlin talks about as slowing our cognitive processes. And you'll see why here in a minute. Okay? So we've got my mother and my father are divorced. Each has remarried. And in the problems that follow, Steve is not my father and Beth is not my mother. So we've defined by exclusion. The question then is, given those situations in what's called the half-sister problem, among the following, who is my half-sister? and we'll give you each of these, okay? Amy has as her parents, my father and Beth. Carolyn has as her parents, Steve and Beth. Patty has my father and my mother as her parents. And Maria has Steve and my mother as her parents. So among the four, Amy, Carolyn, Patty, and Maria, which of those are my half-sisters? Amy and Maria, yes. You're correct. Smith and Clark gave this problem, that specific problem, and it was solved by 94% of the people who looked at it. And yet the amazing thing is, 
that they were also given the Thogs problem, and in that situation also, only about 10% of the, of the participants solved the problem. And yet, it's exactly the same problem. That is, if you think about it, to be my half-sister, that person can have one but not both of my parents as, his, as her parents. That's exactly the same situation that was set up with the Thogs. To be a Thog, you either have to have one of the colors I wrote, the, either the color or the shape that I wrote down. To be my half-sister, you have to have either or the other of the parents that I had. It is factually exactly the same problem. Look at how much easier it was for you to solve that. I mean, we had half the class mouthing out the correct answer there. Amy and Maria, because obviously Amy has, has uh, Beth, who's not my parent, as one of her parents, and, and Maria has, has Steve, who's not one of my parents, as one of hers. So she has to be a half-sister, given that they, they share, in one case, my father, and in one case, my mother. Very easy when it's tied to real-world experiences that we've had. And the shift from, from real to abstract makes a significant difference in, in how easy the problem is to solve. Hence, the idea that when it comes to problem solving, what you wish to do is to create real-world examples to the extent that those are possible. Okay? We're going to stop at this point. We'll pick it up next time with, with uh, Lecture 22, and we have a guest that I hope will be visiting.